I am calling the meeting, the which meeting? I am calling the regular governing board meeting of March 12, 2024 to order with a quorum at 6.03 p.m. <clears throat> Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? I'm not seeing any. Do we have any public comment? Not seeing any, let's go prior meeting minutes. Jeremy, do you have a motion for us? Yeah, motion to approve the February 13th, 2024 meeting minutes as drafted uh, with some uh, late, uh, last minute revisions that John Morris provided me. Do we have a second? Second. second. Okay, seconded by Tom Fisher. Uh, any objections? <clears throat> to the motion. Any abstentions? David Healy. Okay, David Healy is abstaining from the motion. I wasn't at the meeting. And the motion passes. Uh, per minute. Treasurer's report, Lori Bath. Hey, uh, good evening, everybody. It's Dave Mannix here. We've got- Or David. Yeah, we've got a new cadence for our financial reports. They come out after the 15th, which is this week. Uh, our new cadence, as I've reported to this group before, is we're going to uh, close the books by the 15th, and then on our regular finance and audit meeting, we'll evaluate the financials and do the executive summary and send that out to this governing board. And I did send out the January results uh, about three weeks ago for January, and and then um, you'll have a chance at the next governing board uh, to hear about the um, the prior month's report. So I think this this cycle is probably about a week early for asking for a treasurer's report. For do we have month. the January report? We do. Have we yes. gone over the January stuff? We, I, not, not for this group. We can, which would be fine if you'd like to. Um, would you like to guys talk about uh, January? Uh, I mean, if it's if we're not going to discuss January, then we may as well just remove the treasurer's report from the from the agenda because it's always going to be behind. So we need to go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, I was going to say that yeah, we we need to you know if the reports are a month behind, that's fine. But I mean, I, I think a brief summary yeah. of where we stand as okay. of the most recent report sure uh, is important yeah. to give to the group. Yeah. So, so the, please go ahead yeah. with that. Yeah, so the the executive summary is um, there's some, some overarching updates, and then we, we go into the details. But the overarching update is that we still lag on our Eustace bills um, from 2023 and even stretching into 2024. We've talked about this at executive committee. And uh, Lori Beth and Bonnie in accounting are keeping a estimate of what those charges are. So we, we have that understanding about what that impact is to our income statement. Um, so that's the first issue. And I don't know if that's gonna, gonna be corrected uh, in 24 either. It's just a problem with Eustace not being timely and their submitting of invoices, but we're working on that. Uh, but it's a known risk and we just have to monitor it. At this point, it's about 1.3 million that we've, we've been able to, um, to estimate. and and reserve on our on our books. The next update is that uh, the team has is, is actually got our, um, our our balances, our cash balances into a sweep account. And we're we're now seeing uh, interest on our grant funds and January reported uh, an income of $6,500 interest on, on that cash balance. And we'll, we'll continue that, yeah. Um, we had slower than ex anticipated customer installations, and Janiel and, and David can go into that on the operations update. Um, we are hoping to get 15 a, a week, and we had a little bit less than that in January. So obviously that, that results in less um, revenue coming in the funnel at the top, and that was reflected in January's actuals. But we did get an update today, and they do anticipate in getting 15 done this week. Obviously, mud season is going to slow that down a bit, but I think for for year to date, we're a little bit behind on our installations um, that that generate those that that uh, revenue stream. We've begun to expend town ARPA funds for for uh, drops in installations, and we we uh, allocated seventy six thousand five hundred 
in the towns of Callis, East Montpelier, and Worcester uh, that are um, focused on, on the uh, drop in installation costs. Any questions on the update on that high level summary? Uh, balance sheets highlights, uh, we had uh, cash on hand of 5.7 uh, 5 million at the end of the month. Uh, our fixed assets, which are deployed is 2.8 million, accounts payable 160 grand, and deferred revenue or unspent revenue on the balance sheet is 4.7 million. On the income statement, um, the uh, we sp spent 310K of our construction grant uh, in the month of January towards uh, construction. And as I reported, the town ARPA funds applied for installations with 76,000 and subscriber revenue of 10K and the investment income of six. So these are going to be the, the, the OPEX metrics we're going to be watching fairly closely um, as we move in and begin to, in, to install more and more subscribers. We want to see that, that top of the funnel uh, increasing each month. Expenses, and we had a, a favorable administrative uh, costs of 20K uh, due to late starts on consulting and licensing. So I send that information off to Janelle, and she gave me an update on uh, a couple of different expense categories that she's working on. So we're, we're good there. There's nothing to be concerned about. Uh, the construction costs were favorable due to the fewer than planned miles constructed. We did 25 miles of construction versus the plan of 27. Uh, and as I mentioned, also, we're going to see that lag of late billing by Eustace that shows up as favorability on our on our uh, plan, but we're still reserving what we think those costs are going to be. So after all that, the net income was 84K after income and expenses. So that's a highlight of our um, balance sheet and income statement. For the uh, finance projects updates, uh, we're going to start- Alec Gilbert the, has his hand up. Yeah, Alan, go ahead, sorry. Wouldn't look at this David, I just wanted to say thank you for the work you're putting in on these reports. They're really helpful, and I appreciate Great. it. I think okay. I think everybody else does too. And I will correct Absolutely. that spelling on Worcester, Alan. I got your notes, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big deal around here. I get it. <laughs> All right. And just a quick update on finance projects. We work with Bonnie and the accounting team. She's setting up the, the mechanism we're going to be using for starting depreciation of our of our fixed assets, which is something that's important so that we, we keep accurate records of uh, the value of our business. And as we light up DAs and start actually uh, deploying our assets, we need to start that depreciation process. So we'll be working on that here probably in Q2 and have that, that buttoned up by, by the end of the second quarter so that we can uh, start that properly. The uh, finance team is supporting the work uh, that Savon has asked us to work on relative to the drop policy. And I think we've got an update on that. So we've done some cost analysis on, on the impact of, of changing our policy on the drop policy. So we'll have, I think at our next meeting, a bit of a, an update on the financial impact of some decisions we need to make on that. And we've also got in the financial package, if you guys look at like the next to the last page on the update of the finance update is gonna be a year to date summary of our town ARPA spend. And I know that's important to a lot of people about how are we deploying those town ARPA commitments. And you'll be able to see that by month. Uh, and, and, the, and the kind of the cheat sheet to that is just take your total town dollars allocated and divide that by $1,500. And that tells you how many installations were attributed to each town. And then, and then lastly, uh, the finance committee, we're going to start to work on a quarterly forecast because we, we built the plan. We used the expect, expectations that we had for the plan. And then, of course, everything changed. And, uh, uh, you know, be, between grant funding and weather and other impacts, are moving us further and further away from what we plan. So we're gonna to start to give you guys a forecast of what we see on a rolling basis each quarter uh, so that we can stay abreast of, uh, of our income and our, and our um, expenses. So that's the update for January. And again, you can expect an update for February uh, after we get, we get closed on the 15th. Right, anybody have any more questions for David? Okay, I'm not seeing any. We'll move on to construction materials and warehousing update. 
Is that you, sure. Janelle? So yeah, I can start it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'll start it and then I'll ask Lucas to, for more uh, color to it if he wants to add it. But um, we are going through our transition with NEK Broadband as our new warehouse manager. We've given notice to Straight Line Broadband and their contract will end on May uh, 20th. And we've already started the counting and the transition, getting the new warehouse manager in place. Um, we are looking good on materials. We still have several reels of fiber at the WEC storage yard that we may need to um, clear out or not, depending on what kind of heads up they give us. They've given us a heads up that we might need to move those materials. Um, and we got confirmation today that our finale quantities are now up to date. We just have to work on ironing out a few of the, the pricing of those things. So that's great news. Um, Lucas, do you want to add anything to that update? So I would just add, and I haven't had a chance to talk to you about this yet, Janiel, but I was asked by um, Jason at NEK to meet with the warehouse staff this week and just kind of run over their 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 options going forward, um, awesome. which I'm 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 happy to do and and gauge any interest that they may have in in staying on, um, which is our our best bet. So. Yep. Um, and like you said, other than that, all the inventory is in. I was actually in there yesterday. I got eyes on it, so it's definitely in there. I was able to verify everything, and everything else looks good. That is such good news. Yeah, Siobhan? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you to kind of give a brief update for the people who've not been able to attend for a couple of months, why this change? Yeah, so we we had we had hired um, we had hired Straight Line Broadband to uh, be our warehouse manager and inventory manager. We decided that it would it would save resources and be more efficient if we worked with our sister CUD um, NEK Broadband. They have experience in warehouse management, and we can proceed with the finale, which we've been using, and their expertise, saving resources um, and, and, and consolidating resources, both human resources and uh, warehouse resources. Um, they have the same builds, the same equipment and materials that we have, and it just overall will save CV Fiber some money and time as well. And it'll also streamline and smooth out our audit process for next year, since we've both CUDs have learned a lot about the audit process. Um, so next year we'll we'll be better equipped to um, jump on the audit and have a smoother audit process going forward. Great. And construction. We are live in four uh, DAs. We're live in CLO1, CLO2, RSO1, and RSO2. We have made significant progress after going to the Public Service Department. Uh, we've made significant progress with Hardwick Electric and they're, they've given us the green light. Um, we are continuing cons to construct there. And our primary focus with construction is on installation. So we're, we're, um, we're focusing on getting as many installations as possible as part of our construction goal. Lucas, you want to add to that? Uh, I'll just add that, that next in line, we were able to get uh, the GMP make ready done for Gould Hill, which Alan or David will correct me if I get the town wrong, but I believe it's in Worcester. Um, so that'll be sort of the next phase in addition to getting back on, on Route 14 through Woodbury, um, as Hardwick Electric has, has made good progress there for us. So that's our, ne our next areas. Great. David Maddox has his hand up. Yes, Go ahead, thank David. you, Saban. Yeah, yeah. as Janil said, the focus is on installations. And for us, there is a, a backlog of customer demand that um, that's waiting for us to install. So I, I think it's great that we're focused on getting those installations done so we can meet those commitments and start that revenue. So I, I think that really needs to be a primary focus for us, um, at least for the first half of the year, right, Janil? Absolutely. Yep. The, and you know what? That's getting people connected. That's our opportunity to give amazing local customer service. So that builds our reputation. Um, and it also it it um it, it's revenues. So that's you know it it helps us with our funding app. So there's it's a win win in every direction. It also helps us get to the rev the the bond market faster. So there are a number and, of positives. And do you recall what the backlog for for the weeks was, Janelle, that we mentioned earlier? I don't. Was it, it was 310 minus 70, right? So I, I think it's 
roughly around 280 yeah. or something like that. Which was something like 20 weeks or... Yeah, oh yeah, right. And then we did the calculation. We thought that maybe 50% of the 20% 20 20 yeah. of conduit wouldn't take, but right. So 20% of conduit, 20% of our backlog probably needs conduit based on what we think we know. Um, and 50% of those customers may not take. So we think we're, our estimate is that it would be about 18 weeks if we consider the conduit customers. So we're backlogged about 18 weeks, but that doesn't consider that some people may drop out and then some people may sign on. Um, is it going to be more people signing on than dropping out? We don't know. That's maybe a wash. Mm -hmm. But if we just take what we know right now, we're backlogged about 18, about 18 weeks. Do and we the know conduit folks, sorry. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to ask, do we know why conduit folks may be dropping out? Is anybody telling us that? We know or it's do we expensive. Have that? <laughs> we know it's expensive, um, and also we know that we haven't been able to lay conduit since um, the ground froze, and we might see an increase in conduit takers um, as as we get through mud season. And we probably need to get okay. past mud season to do that. Mm -hmm. But the the other question there is the availability of crews to install the conduit. We do have a list of conduit contractors on our website that we vetted, but there is a limitation. I know at the end of last fall, some people weren't able to schedule conduit because there, there was a limitation in the workforce. So something seriously to consider is that we might want to vet more conduit contractors so that there, there are more uh, available resources. Yeah, and also just sometimes they have to re-up contracts while they're waiting for conduit. So maybe the stars don't align timing wise. Um, so unfortunately, you know, they might need to wait two years or you know, you know, whatever the uh the contracts are for things like Starlink or Consolidate, I guess is is still doing contracts for DSL, which I didn't know about until recently. So um you know, if 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 they were forced to re up a contract, they they may not be able to get out of it until that's expired. Yeah. Okay. So that does anybody have any more discussion about construction materials and warehousing? Otherwise, we'll slide into operations. That seems like a segue. Let's segue into operations. Go ahead. Yeah, we really did already start segueing because um, <laughs> the big part of operations is the the uh, the installations that we're focusing on with Waitsfield, um, and also working on that drops policy with Waitsfield. Um, we have 146 147 customers as of today, um, and we have 16 scheduled installs for next week. Lucas, do you want to add to that? No, and that about covers it. Yeah, I mean, we're we're ramping up the drops, and as the ground gets more clear and we can do the underground drops, it'll just open up more opportunity. So that's what we're looking forward to right now. <laughs> David Healy. David Healy. I was just going to say, go ahead, David. Yeah, the other operations issues are going on that we'll be talking this week at the operations committee hearing include the bead challenge, um, sort of trying to deal with where do we go next in terms of our building and a few other issues like that that we'll be working on the next couple of weeks. Yep. Does anybody else have any questions or comments about, oh, there's something in chat, something in chat. Oh, that's just David talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Constructing conduit is not cheap. Yes, that's what we're hearing. Tom Fisher has direct experience with how not cheap it is. Um. All right, the next thing is marketing update. Is that you, Olivia? That is me. Um, Go for I will it. Start with, I will start with the uh, documentary premiere of Connected. We are all very excited. Um, Janielle was interviewed actually the day of our Callus ribbon cutting ceremony behind the scenes for that documentary, and it is premiering tomorrow. It's a documentary that is sponsored by VCBB, and um, all of the effort was by a local company called Well Told Film. So if you are available in the area, you want to catch up with us, um, some friendly faces. We'll be in Montpelier tomorrow at the Capitol Theater at 4.30. All are invited, um, everyone from the public. So if you have any friends or family that want to join, uh, please extend the invite um, from our behalf. 
in terms of outreach, um, we're seeing a slow trickle and increase for RSO1 and RSO2. Um, we're at about a 23% take rate right now. But again, of course, that doesn't consider anyone that needs conduit which is what Janelle was alluding to now. Um, we don't know if that number will increase or, or decrease in the weeks to come, um, but we are hoping that, you know, as more people see their neighbors getting connected, word of mouth spreads really quickly. Uh, and I've been working with the friendlies for the, the, a small set, subset of our friendlies have needed rotting and or conduit. So unfortunately they haven't been able to get installed just yet. Um, but I'm still working with friendlies um, to make sure that their customer service experience has gone smoothly. We're still sending out new customer survey uh, surveys out in batches every couple of weeks. I do have to say, since I first started, there's been a dramatic shift in tone in the best way possible. So kudos to everybody on the team um, who has made you know valiant efforts in order to help uh, support and really bring world-class service throughout the entire experience. Um, spring planning, we'll be at the Woodbury Pie Breakfast. We'll be with John Reed uh, on March 23rd. We're actually donating a $99 gift certificate that to go towards an installation, um, which is something that we're looking forward to. And we're also scheduling our email outreach for a Q1 community update in April. Um, for customers, I am building out a brand new page on our website with connectivity tips and tricks that's being informed by some of the frequently asked questions from the customer service team um, at Waitsfield. So again, we're now divvying up content based on where you are in the journey. So if you are pre-install, you'll get one email. If you are post-install um, and you are already a, a connected customer, you'll get another email. So now we're creating really curated pieces of content, um, which I think will help, you know, in terms of the, the experience moving forward. So Olivia, when you say a 23% take rate, which is what I think you said, do you mm -hmm. mean that that's orders versus how many people who could have ordered, not installations? Correct. Not so, actually installed. Okay. Right. So when so in the world of marketing for take rate, and I know that definitions are really important, uh, we take the number of orders that we currently have. So people have ordered, meaning they've selected their internet package, divided by the eligible service points within a specific DA, and that's how we get to the to the rate. Now, we've been doing a little bit of take rate analysis also to see if that will impact our business model as well, because now we actually have data points, which is really exciting. So we can help inform our forecast moving forward, depending on how much, you know, extra oomph that we need um, for outreach versus, you know, taking a step back and thinking about things a little bit more strategically, because we do have a little bit of a backlog now. Um, so when we schedule, let's say, town hall forums, um, we may want to wait a little bit uh, because, again, lessons learned in the beginning, we were maybe a little bit too early with outreach. And now that there's been a shift in tone, we want to make sure that whatever the lead time is, right, if we can nail down what that lead time, whether it's three months, six months, whatever it is, what is considered within the realm of reasonableness for a customer. And I think that's the biggest challenge right now. Anyone have any questions about marketing? I'm not seeing any. I'm going to move on to committee and board membership. I'm going to start with committee. Um, some of our committees are getting a little bit light, and I know that it's a time commitment. I know that it's hard to carve out that time, um, but if we could get some folks who you don't have to be on the board, if you know citizens or have friends who might be willing to just serve on a committee with some expertise or just willing to help and provide input, that would be great. Um, operations and Chuck, your communications, right? Chuck is communications. Um, actually, <laughs> we have what? Policy, communications, operations, is that it? And yeah. yeah. Finance. Finance, that's right, finance. I'm sorry, I did, that was rude. I'm sorry. <laughs> what, is, what is wrong with me? <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. So if any of these things can be of interest to you, Chuck, you can go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. 
Yep, good. Uh, I would just like to announce to the board uh, that the communications committee has opted to move our regular meeting schedule uh, to be the third Thursday of each month, starting at 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, so if that happens to make it a more viable time for somebody who would be interested in joining the communications committee, we'd welcome you to join us. Wow, not an evening meeting. Nice. That's nice. Very snazzy. You're trying to scoop all the committee members, Chuck. <laughs> John Reed, go ahead. So I think I have time to be on a second uh, committee if that is yes. helpful. I don't have enough uh, context to know who's coming and going and uh, where it would be most useful. Um, so I kind of leave that up to you and the committee chairs, but be happy to do that. Honestly, John, based on what you've said and what others have said about you, I think operations is the place for you. And if you're willing to do operations, that would be like freaking awesome. We would like that a lot. That, that's up to you and David. So, <laughs> but I'd be happy to do that. David, you're on mute. David Mannix, you get your hand up, but I'm yeah, gonna let David I, Healy respond. Just a second, let David Healy respond. I was gonna that. nominate John Reed to become a member of the uh, operations committee. <laughs> second. <laughs> okay. That, John Reed has been nominated and seconded for the operations committee. Do I have any contrary, any no's, uh, opposed, any opposed? That's the word I wanted. I'm not seeing any opposed, any abstentions. I'm not seeing any abstentions. Therefore, John Reed, you are now on the operations committee. Um, David, please get him uh, uh Agenda. That's what it's called. Get him an agenda, and uh, I thought I thought you were going to say a ball cap and a cup. Yeah. Ball <laughs> cap and a cup. All right, David Mannix, well, you were going to say something. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Congratulations, John. Thanks for joining. I, I've actually got a, a candidate that surfaced during our search for a finance manager role. His name is John Burke, and he's currently uh, he's out of Cabot, and he's currently a CFO, so he's got the right skill set. And he's expressed an interest in joining the finance committee. We're we're really excited. We we've we've had added him to our committee for a couple of meetings, and he's chimed in and had nice contributions. We'd like to add him to the finance committee. So I'm going to put that up for consideration tonight. I know the executive committee had a chance to talk to him and learn a little bit about him at the last meeting. He can't, couldn't join tonight, uh, but I did want to uh, offer him up as a potential candidate for our committee. Second, I think we can. I was just going to say, I think we can go ahead and accept that as a motion and a second from Chuck Burt. Um, do Thank I hear you. any opposed to what was his name again? I'm sorry. John Burt. John Burt. John yes. Burt. John Burt. Um, do I hear yeah. any? Burke. Burke. Yes. Burke. Burke. Yes. I'm not seeing any objections. Do I hear any abstentions? Not seeing any abstentions. John Burke is appointed to the Finance Committee as a civilian member. Thank you. Yay! No, thank you. Yay. All right. So again, it takes some time to think about it. Uh, I just wanted to get that out there and see if we could get some more people on because um, many hands make light work and we appreciate it and I won't belabor that point anymore. Uh, board membership. We have a number of positions that are open. Um, I know that you are here as an appointed delegate for your town or alternate, um, but if you know anybody in any of the towns that we're missing, which are, I had the list up, but then I had to went and changed everything. Hold on a second. Uh, Montpelier, Northfield, and Washington, I'm showing is completely empty. And we need, oh, and Barrytown. And we need an alternate for Barry City and Barrytown. And I haven't seen or heard anything from Dan Jones, who's the appointed alternate for Montpelier for several years. David, do you remember Dan? And do you, have you seen or heard anything from him? I don't think he has any interest. Okay. All right. Um, I can confirm that he doesn't have the interest. Okay. Oh, cool, cool, cool. All right. So I think we could probably remove Dan Jones, but I think we can't do that until we get a definite 
statement from Montpelier right. on that. So we can consider that alternate position as open for right now. Uh, Northfield also needs an alternate. Roxbury needs an alternate. And Washington needs an alternate. And Williamstown needs an alternate. Technically, I need an alternate because my alternate has never shown up anywhere or talked <laughs> to me ever. So... Um, <laughs> That, so that's where we are. So if you know people, tell them what a great time we have and how much fun this is and how important the work we're doing is so they can feel really good. David, go ahead. I just want to introduce Jared. If you haven't ever met Jared, Jared's going to be replacing me as a delegate from Calus beginning in May. Ooh. Jared, do you want to introduce Jared. yourself? Uh, hey, I'm Jared Thomas. I'm uh, David's neighbor, and I'm um, happy to be here. Welcome, Jared. We're happy to have you, Jared. All right, so does anybody else have anything to say about committee or board membership? I should probably mention about we've got training coming up on the, was that the 27th? Yes, we have board training on the 27th. It will be from 5.30 to 8. Um, all, all delegates should have received an invitation. It will be human resources required training plus a fun optional training, all, all wrapped into one um, two and a half hour training where we will go through a day in the life um, of the CV fiber. And we'll talk about what is expected, anticipated from delegates, um, as well as having our human resources consultant, HR happens um, available and doing presentation and a Q&A session. It should be interact. It will be interactive. It should be a good time, educational, and it will be recorded for anyone who can't make it real time. It will be shown to every board member who joins later and we will do this recurring annually and chuck burt's got his hand up yeah uh sean you indicated that northfield needed an alternate but i thought northfield was still down a primary delegate as well um and i actually spoke I... yeah yes they are Okay, uh, I spoke to somebody who um, uh, works for Norwich about a month and a half ago, and he expressed interest in joining. Um, and so I'll I'll reach back out to him and, and see where his head is at Get on him. that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chuck. And Lori Beth, your hand is up. Go ahead, please. Yes, um, they right after our meeting, there is a town meeting and on the agenda, is the delegates for CV Fiber. So hopefully Yay. we'll hear something. Yeah, they uh, put out the advertisement for people that are interested about a week ago. So we'll see what happens. I'm hoping that- and Which town know. is this, Lori Beth, I'm sorry? Northfield. Northfield, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. All right. So you might not have to reach out, Chuck. <laughs> All right, somebody else had their hand up, but it's gone. Alan, go ahead. Siobhan, can can you just make clear to everybody? I think that the training on the twenty seventh is is just online, correct? There's no yes, there's no in person option. Okay, just so people yes. know that. Yeah, it's just online and it will be recorded, so we can do this. And this is a mandatory training. This is something that we are required by law to have, or by regulation, by grant regulation, or there's a lot of reasons why we're having it and it's a good idea. And so we're going to do it. And, uh, and if I have to be there, y'all have to be there. <laughs> no, no, that's, but we're going to be recording it so you can watch it later. So if it's not going to work out, we'll make it available. Any other comments or discussion about community membership, board membership, training, anything like that? All right, we're going to move on to the human resources. Oh, well, the board training reminder, we just moved into that. We just did that. So that's done. We could cross that one off. Uh, drops update. Janiel, you want to talk about the drops update? Yes. So we are, we, we originally had on our website a policy that would would charge the customer $1 per foot after 400 feet starting from the takeoff pole. And as you, 
as you can tell by what I just said, that was confusing um, because people were <laughs> saying, what is the takeoff poll? Where does the dollar a foot start? To where? To Right. So it just it created way more questions than answers. And then when we spoke with Waitsfield about what they were doing practically on the ground, we learned that they just simply weren't charging the customer, quoting the customer for that um, amount. So rather than having a convoluted policy drive the practice. We decided that it would make sense to have the practice drive the policy if it was financially feasible. So we had Waitsfield run the numbers on all of the drops that they've done so far and do an analysis on what the average cost is past um, past 400 feet and what it would cost CV Fiber to take up that cost. Uh, we made the determination that it makes much more sense to use the, the practical application to drive the policy rather than the other way around, that the, the cost to CV Fiber would be minimal, that the confusion to the customer would be eliminated. And uh, so we're now taking the, the findings, the numbers, and we're putting it into a written policy to be considered by the executive committee and then voted on by the board. So that's where we're at with that. Um, we're also doing a higher level comprehensive analysis of overall costs, and that's going to be through the Finance and Audit Committee primarily, but we're looking at other costs. Um, another aside about the drops policy, when we go into bead, we're required to bring fiber to the home in under bead. So we're going to be required to do this anyway. And it just makes sense to apply the policy that we'll need to apply starting next year um, that our operator has been applying already um, across the board. So that's where we're at. Do you want to do you want to add any? Does anyone else who's been on this working group want to add anything? We had a a large working group. Then, it, yeah, David Healy. A lot of factors went into this, and and one of them is just equity. Um, the distance between an MST and a house is varied hugely, depending on where the MST is and where your house is. Where you could be next door to an MST, or you could be a thousand feet from MST. So it just became a complication, combination of factors to make the thing more equitable and, and easy to understand. Yeah, one one of the things that was kind of important for me in thinking about this was how can we justify charging people for a year and then suddenly not charging people when bead comes through? That was that was one that I struggled with a lot because that's just not right. Um, Alan, go ahead. Siobhan, of the connections that have been made, do we know what the average length of the connection is? David, do you know that? Yeah, go ahead, David. You're muted. And Waitsfield gave us those numbers, Alan. Yeah. I don't have them off the tip of my tongue. But because I, have, I, I, I have to tell you one one thing that 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 I've been thinking about just recently because of somebody who called me and said they're very likely way over 400 feet. And I'm starting to think, oh my gosh, are we going to have a whole bunch of people way over 400? I suddenly realized there are going to be a lot of people under 400. So yep. if we have if we quite have one, yeah, quite a few. So, so that it, it's if we assume that 1500 really is going to do it for everybody, whether it's 100 feet or 700 feet or 800 feet, that's terrific, and that seems that seems very fair to the customers and also fair to uh, Wastefield Champlain because they have less labor and less and fewer materials to go into a shorter drop. Um, so I, 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 I'm feeling better and better the more we move towards this much more equitable uh, uh, schedule, uh, we might say of costs. Uh, the, and I think it's, I think it's going to work for our our customers as well as for Wakefield Champlain Telecom, it's going to work for us. It's going to take a lot of tension off. So thanks John for the Morris, work that's gone oh, into all this. Sorry, stuff. Alan. John Morris, go ahead, please. Well, I'd like to get some clarification on on what exactly this means. Uh, my understanding is that uh, what we're 
what you're saying is that CV fiber is not going to charge the dollar a foot if uh, a house requires more than 400 feet of fiber. So if somebody's house is 700 feet from the from the MST or whatever, uh, they'll still get the same $99 installation cost. Uh, but what if it's 700 feet and two poles have to be set? Uh, are they automatically responsible for for those two poles, or is CV Fiber taking on the two poles? What's what's going on with that? Um. Hey, Saban. It's, yeah. it's David. Go ahead, David. Can, can I take a can, can I take a swing at that? Right. Yeah. So go we're, ahead. We're, please. We're, we're we're putting together a great question, John. We're putting together some numbers right now, working with David and the NRTC design data to to really understand that. You know, what's the risk to CV fiber in terms of cost and applicability? And right now, to, to kind of get back to a question that Alan answered, about half of the total drops, and that's MST to premise, right, all the way down, about half of those are under the wire, meaning they're less than 400 feet, okay? And the, the balance of them are a mixture of some increments that, that we put together that we'll be able to share when we give our final update. But that, that extreme case that you, you referenced, John, is about 5% of the potential uh, subscribers have those unusually long drops. And, and that's what we're really trying to get our arms around is how, how big is the risk and what's the cost? So we're, we're putting all those variables into a spreadsheet. And we're looking at the potential cost to CV fiber and the potential return on saving that, that potential subscriber versus losing them because they don't want to make that, that investment. And we're, we're going to give you guys some return data that says it's a good thing to do to go ahead and invest in this relationship because in the long run, due to that subscription rate, we're going to be okay. But we want to make sure. So we're, we're, we're working through the numbers now. We don't have anything we're ready to share yet, but we're working through what that might look like. Uh, Are you so satisfied? Go ahead, John. Uh, I'd like to ask a follow-up question. Uh, sure. So it sounds like CV Fiber is considering the possibility of covering the, the setting of poles where that's necessary. Um, it seems to me that that may not be uh, equitable, given that we already are refusing to uh, to consider the possibility of setting conduit. Uh, we already are saying that the homeowner is required to set the, their own conduit. Uh, and mm -hmm. I was thinking of the poles as similar to the conduit, and therefore the right. the homeowner has to provide the the way to string the fiber, and CV fiber is stringing the fiber. Right. So, it, and that's part of the analysis. You know, we're trying to understand what what's the cost of conduit to us. You know, what's the cost of 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 aerial drop. And what's the extreme? Like I said, it's about 5% of those subscribers that have those unusually large. And by unusually large, I mean greater than 1,600 feet. That, that's the population we're talking about. It's about 5%. So, so you're looking at the possibility of possibly taking on all of those installation costs. Yeah. If yeah. that from, works from, out for from an, fiber. Yeah, from an equity, from an equity perspective, we're, we're trying to evaluate and, and there's going to be blurred lines, right? Like what you're bringing up here. So we need to work through from a policy perspective what we're going to say. So we need to think of every scenario that, that could present itself and try to come up with something that's fair to the consumer and fair to CV fiber. And that's definitely one of the variables we need to think about. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you Tom Fisher, go ahead, questions. please. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think between the two of you, you just struck most of the points I was going <laughs> to mention, which is um, certainly, John, that's where my mind went as well, both the poles and the conduit, um, thinking very much from a point of view of what is the barrier to entry for our subscribers? Um, you know, that really gets at equity and it gets at our long-term feasibility. And so being able to figure out, you know, this is the price point at which people will tend to take or tend not to take. Um, where can we meet them? Where can we help them? 
and where does it hit us on our bottom line? And then as David alluded to there, it's not so much only looking at the cost to us, but also looking at the revenue to us and figuring out what's the internal rate of return. Um, you know, if we make an investment of that sort, how long is it going to take us to get a payback? And it may turn out that, well, we can do free fiber or $99 fiber for everybody, but we can't do conduit because that would be an unacceptable rate of return. But we can provide those feedback points, you know, internally and figure out, okay, out of these three different options, this looks the most feasible, or this is a rate that we're willing to accept or not. So we're kind of exploring all those different options, kind of different scenarios to, to figure out the best option there. And uh, you done, Tom? Yeah, thanks. Okay, John Reed, go ahead. So as you're looking at uh, parameters, is one of them um, who's on the grid, which would take care of maybe not all the poll situations, but most of them. I yes, just it put, is putting that out. That is, and another. I think it. it uh, it's been our stance. Just, just I want to just be really clear on that for everybody who maybe hasn't been around as much. Our stance has always been that we're getting the customers on the grid first, and we would address off the grid after we dealt with the grid okay. customers. I think our legal obligation is actually limited to on the grid, but I'm not as certain of that. Go ahead, John. Reed. And just a second thing to, to toss out. Uh, I understand all the reasons to not have contracts, but um, It'd be worth considering <clears throat> if CV fibers upfront cost to hook somebody up exceeds a certain amount to consider a, a contract with that subscriber to at least be able to recoup the cost. It, it's, a, it's definitely something for us to think about. Do you have anything else you'd like to add there, John? Okay, we'll go, let's see. John Russell, it is your go. Um, I've been uh, reading about uh, fiber and <clears throat> there really isn't any need to uh, use a conduit with fiber, just like with coax and phone cable. Uh, fiber can, there is fiber, fiber, which can be directly put into the ground without a conduit. So, you know, digging, digging a, a deep a trench and putting in all kinds of sand and stuff like that um, might, might be uh, not necessary. You know, so has anybody been talking about that? Just, you, you don't need conduit. It's Given my there. many years of experience, I would highly, highly, highly say not to do that. Uh huh. Um, but um, but the coax people are doing it, and the phone company is uh, is doing it as well. And, um, and so I, I, if I if I could, Siobhan, I I think this might get down to definitions again. I think when we talk about conduit, we're talking about a process, and maybe Lucas could talk to this, where the fiber is buried with a machine at the same time it has a conduit wrap around it that that embeds the the fiber and the conduit at the same time so we we may be talking about the same thing here lucas can you can you talk about what that looks like yes yeah, so i mean works? there can be pvc and, and there can be split duct um pvc is 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 obviously the the stronger uh material split duct works in certain scenarios, generally inside, not necessarily buried. Um, given Vermont's frost and critters and everything else, if you don't have some kind of a strong um, strong protector on it, it will get broken. I have spent many sleepless nights and, and, and lost weekends to things like that. Um, so I would not ever suggest anybody direct berry uh, uh, fiber in Vermont. If you live in the Midwest, maybe, or, you know, different terrains, but not, not here as much. I'd also like to add here that our partner, uh, Waitsfield has specifications for what the requirements are that in their experience and, uh, <laughs> um, and so we are, in a cert to a certain extent, beholden to that because we're not going to be changing their specs. Their specs are their specs for reasons, and and we're not really in a position to question that. Um, 
John Morris, I'm going to skip you and go to Jeremy because he hasn't spoken yet. And then we'll come back to you, John Morris. Go ahead, Jeremy. You're muted, Jeremy. I think maybe your head, is your earpiece, down, your uh, microphone down. All right, Jeremy, you figure it out, and we'll talk to John Morris while you're while you're uh, working on that. Um, <laughs> now I, this is embarrassing. I, I think I have forgotten what my question was. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I all have to pass. Thank you. Okay. Can people right. hear me now? Yes, there you go, Jeremy. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that Trevon said pretty much exactly what I was going to say, almost word for word. So, uh, yeah, no, I mean, we, we want to do something that's solid and isn't going to break, especially if we're the ones paying for it and are responsible for fixing it in the middle of the night, in the middle of a ice storm when it goes out. Yeah. Um, all right, do I have any more questions or comments about the drops update? Oh, Jerry, Jerry Diamantinis, please go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I just want to point out that, you know, John Morris raises a great hypothetical, but the probability of, as John Reed had said, the probability of somebody having electricity and they don't have either poles or conduit is really, really, really low. So I, I'm not sure how that would even be possible um, that somebody has electric service, but they don't have poles and they don't have conduits. So I, I wouldn't get too far wrapped around this um, because I'm I'm not sure it's really a possibility. I'll, I'll stop with that. Thank you, Jerry. Go ahead, John Morris. I do remember my question, but I would like to respond to Jerry um, just for what it's worth. Um, I'm imagining a scenario where somebody has conduit, uh, has the electricity in conduit to their house, uh, but it doesn't have room to string an additional uh, fiber through that conduit, which means that it either needs to be buried or poles needs to be set. Uh, and I know that that's a possibility. It's a, it, it would be required at my house if I didn't have other situation already going on. And I know some residents of my town are in exactly that situation with several hundred feet of conduit. And uh, they're going to have to to either bury a new conduit for the fiber or uh, set poles closer to their house. Uh, so anyway, my question is about the bead question that came up uh, a few minutes ago. Um, and I, I was wondering, does the bead grant uh, require us to set uh, to pay for the conduit anyway, because we are required to provide the service completely. Janiel, do you know the um, answer to that? Um, uh, no, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I think that might be a little bit of a gray area. Um, I, I, I do know that we're going to have to go to every house, um, but in a situation where a customer might need conduit, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that that, I'm not sure anybody knows the answer to that at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeremy, Matt. Uh, so I also wanted to respond to Jerry and just say that I have neither poles nor conduit and I do have electricity. I was wrote it to, I was actually turning over my garden by hand, luckily, and found my, electric service buried about 18 inches under the ground, direct wow. buried. House built good. in 85. Dude. And I did have my neighbor Rhoda tilled my garden the year before. And uh, it couldn't have been missing it by more than a couple of inches. So anyway, just throwing that out there. It's not it's not going to be unheard of. <laughs> no fiber for you. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm putting in conduit. I, you know, so I guess if CB Fiber is paying for it, I'm not going to argue. But um, no, CB Fiber isn't. 
CV Fiber <laughs> isn't currently proposing, just to get it on the record, CV Fiber is not currently proposing to pay for conduit. That's still a customer expectation. Um, but as but as um, uh, David Manick said, we are assessing all of our costs at this point. So the current thought is that we would we would not cover the cost of conduit, but we are doing a comprehensive analysis of all pricing. Thanks, Gino. Yeah, I had a, uh, sorry, David, but I'm gonna tell a little bit of story. It'll be short. I had a friend who whose mother bought a cabin in the seventies and it didn't have phone service. So she ran the phone line herself through the trees down to meet up with the phone line because she didn't want to pay the phone company to install it. So stuff like that happens around here. Um, that is the drops update. Uh, I'm not seeing any more discussion here. Uh, let's go to the MOU update. Janiel, you're drinking, but I can understand that. So we can wait. No, a this is water. <laughs> um, so, oh, by the way, I, I, I want to just say something about this. Um, when we're on a public meeting being recorded, let's make sure that whatever we're drinking isn't an alcoholic beverage. I'm just going to stop there. Um, I think it's really important for us to, 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 to remember that though. Um, the MOU, so we are talking about uh, doing work with NEK Broadband. They're our sister CUD contiguous to us. They have about double the talents that we have. And we are, we are, uh, we signed an MOU with them. We met with a VCBB yesterday in an executive session to give an update about where we're at. And where, where we're at is we are considering maybe being able to use some NEK ARPA funds in some areas of CV fiber. Now, this is not a definite at this point. This is something that is being considered. This is something that VCBB has to consider and that we have to assess all of the addresses um, that may apply um, in CV fiber territory. So we're looking we're looking at how we could possibly work together to optimize our grants within the state of Vermont. That is funding that that is currently at NEK. How that could benefit CV fiber and future funding for CV fiber. How it could mutually benefit NEK broadband. So we're we're looking at shared resources, including the warehouse management that we've talked about before. Um, and we're talking about how we can otherwise share resources, financial resources, human resources, resources, um, and other things. Um, as we start looking at BEAD and whether we can do a joint application in BEAD, it has become clear that we cannot do a consortium as we originally thought we could do. It is prohibited. Under the BEAD rules, one CD, one CUD is one CUD. So now we, 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 we want to start socializing the concept of a more traditional merger. Um, that would allow us to work together toward a uh, bead application that would bring both CUDs more uh, more money. Um, so we're starting from the concept of how can we maximize maximize the dollars brought into Vermont for this all the CUDs. Um, how can that benefit CV Fiber? How can that benefit NEK Broadband? Um, we're just starting the conversations now. We're in a preliminary uh, we're in preliminary discussions about what this looks like, um, but we've brought it up to the CBB um, and we have a piece of legislation in front of the legislature to consider how it will be easier for CUDs to, to formally merge. Um, this would allow each CUD to keep its own structure, its own organizational structure, its own marketing, its own customers, its own brand, um, and, and still allow decisions to be made and legal, uh, illegal considerations for the CUDs to take advantage of those benefits that that might might be better together. For instance, bead optimization and how putting one application in might end up getting us significantly more funding into um, into the state, into the CUD. So there's a lot going on right now, um, both at the legislative level, at the VCBB level, and in discussions with NEK Broadband. David. David Healy. You're on mute. NEK is submitting, is, is developing 
a loan application to USDA reconnect that would include property uh, locations in CB Fiberland. So that'd be a joint 2% loan. And um, I don't know how good the prospects are, but a 2% loan is certainly a lot better than 10%. And um, the the, the uh, applications have to be in by March 22nd or something like that. Yeah. Be, yeah. So it's, first it's a short, first serve, but short yeah. time. Mm -hmm. And since they have already applied one time for a reconnect grant that they got, they're pretty savvy about uploading all the data into the internet to do this application. So let's just hope that works for us. That would give us about 500 addresses from CV Fiber um, that we could build with that 2% loan. So that would be tremendous in, in, in helping with the, the, the funding gap. I also uh, want, just wanted to bring up myself that uh, I like the idea that we're like divisions of a larger umbrella organization. So we retain our branding, we retain our section of the state. Um, and I'm hoping that we can protect that going forward. Um, oh no, John Reed, don't say co-op, don't say co-op. The world will end if we say co-op. Shh, shh. Uh, David Healy, your hand is still up. Did you have something else you wanted to say? And you're muted. No, okay, your hand is back down. Does anybody else have anything they would like to say about this? Uh, all right. Um, Executive Committee Authority. We're looking for input and discussion here. Janiel, do you want to lead this? Yeah, I'd like to cue it up. So, um, in having conversations with um, with NEK Broadband and other CUDs, um, it it's it's becoming clear that some of the major decisions that are made on a daily basis um, by CV Fiber must be made well by the employees, but also maybe it makes more sense to have certain decisions made by executive committee instead of by board. Um, I'll just give you an example. When we did sign the MOU with, with NEK Broadband, NEK Broadband's uh, structure is such that their executive committee makes decisions such as um, authorization to sign MOUs. And our organizational structure still requires um, board approval for such things, including MOUs. So it had to go through our, um, it went through our audit committee, and then it went through our, our finance and audit committee, then it went through our executive committee, then it went through board. Um, now, it didn't set us back, but I could foresee in the future that there is there is a strong argument for putting some of the major decisions currently given to governing board into the hands of executive committee who might be the fewer, more involved um, people within CV Fiber, leaders within CV Fiber, um, rather than requiring a quorum of 11 for a 20 member um, district, it might make more sense to put some of these financial decisions, MOU decisions, contracts decisions in the hands of the executive committee who also meets twice a month. So things would move along more quickly. So uh, what 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 I would propose is that, and I want to socialize this, I want to put in front of executive committee as well, um, that we we limit certain board authority to certain major decisions that impact CV fiber as a whole and or towns, uh, specific towns, because we're we're talking about delegates here. So there are going to be some there are going to be some decisions that might necessarily need to be made board wide. Um, David says be grant application submittal is another area. I think so. And you know, we're looking into potentially um, looking at a loan as well, a six million dollar loan um, with PF or with MCM. Um, there, these are these are major decisions. But at the same time, maybe it makes more sense for these sorts of financial decisions to be in the hands of executive committee. So I wanted to start socializing that with board since. Rather than taking away of authority, I want I want input from the board uh, as to what makes sense to this board wh when it comes to authority. And the the other thing I wanted to I'm just, I'll catch you in a second, Chuck, is that we want to write up what these limitations will be, what you know, what we decide those is going to be important that we want to be nimble about. But we've also run into some situations where 
we might have had to call a special meeting. And if we have to call a special meeting, the it's entirely possible we're not going to get quorum for that. And then it becomes yet longer before we deal with things. OK, Chuck, go ahead. Um, I would like to suggest a reframing uh, rather than considering this as a taking away of authority of the governing board, because I think the governing board technically has authority in all matters all the time. It's a delegation of authority to the executive committee for matters that the governing board is willing to allow the executive committee to operate on our behalf. Um, and and I think you know that's an important framing and distinction for us to be clear on as we consider this proposal. Um, and the second thing I'll say is uh, when we talked about this in executive committee, um, I had indicated that it would be super helpful to see a list of the kinds of things uh, that we think we would do such a delegation on uh, versus things that would remain uh, strictly a board level of authority. Uh, Janiel, I don't know if you had an opportunity to put together such a proposal, and if so, I'd love to see it. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Yeah, I do have something, um, and I'll make sure that you get it. And Tom Fisher, go ahead, please. Yeah, so to be clear, this is a chance for us to, you know, Ben, you're out a few ideas. If you have any ideas after this, you can send them out via email. Um, we're not making a decision tonight on on changing authorities or anything. This is more just airing the idea and getting thoughts out. Um, one idea that um, I brought forth at the executive committee was um, how do we keep this transparent and um, how do we keep the board informed of what's going on at the executive level? Um, and so trying to create, in addition to the various things we produce at these board meetings to kind of provide feedback from the different committees, sort of providing a like, these are called out explicit actions that were taken or things we are considering more than just a general, you know, this is generally what's going on, but actually providing maybe even a visual every board meeting where you can see this is what the executive committee has been doing and, and just make sure that we're, you know, standing up to the, the trust level that is being handed out. One of the ideas that was discussed during executive committee um, and that I did put in the proposal is that we might shift to a monthly um, board packet similar to what VCBB does rather than doing the every other week staff report, have a more comprehensive board packet that would include more of the, the a policy that was just adopted, uh, you know, attachments to it that were meat, the meat and potatoes of what what substance had occurred in the in the previous month or that was proposed to be occurring um, in, in the coming months. So it it would be it would be a more comprehensive package sent out rather than as a staff rather than as a staff report a couple times a month to follow executive committee, it would be a board packet to be sent out prior to each um, governing board. Jeremy, your hand was up and then it's down. I changed my mind. Okay, John Reed, go ahead. Uh, just a couple things. As a new person, this sounds a lot like you know natural evolution from a Herculean primarily all volunteer effort to a operational staffed organization. And second thing, and I defer to Alan on this, is would this be a policy area where it would be worth looking at seeing what other similar organizations do in terms of how they handle authority in terms of how much is staff, how much is the executive committee and how much is full board? You go ahead, Alan. Yeah, I've, I've been thinking about this um, because if any of you have served on other public boards in Vermont, you either experienced people you're serving thinking of you as being too bossy as a board or not being nearly as activist as a board as you could be. Because I think it's a Vermont thing that people serve on boards, you know, we're I, I think we're all really proud of that. And even though in a lot of places, you know, we've had consolidation in school systems in the last five years. I think the people who who are now on those boards realize that what's happening is all the school schools are being basically managed through something called policy governance. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but if you work in the education field, if you're a person who believes in 
local power from the bottom up. You hate policy governance. If you think the superintendent and the principal should be making all the decisions and they report to you what they've done within the parameters of what your policies say, then you think policy governance is a really good idea. So I, I think one of the things we don't want to lose is the fact that we're, I think, I think we're, we're making, we've made some really good connections with our communities through the work that we've done. And my guess is it's not unlike what happened with the electric co-ops back in the 1930s and 1940s, to the point that, you know, if you look at, a, at an organization like Washington Electric Co-op, they still have a board that's basically pretty active. You know, they, they have very slim, very slim staff. They have a total of what, I think about 35 employees for the whole operation. Um, and the board is very, very active and makes a lot of major policy decisions after a lot of discussion. So I, I I think we should be I think we should be doing a lot of a lot of thinking, talking, discussion, research about the ins and outs of how something like this could work so that whatever we choose works as well as it possibly can. But it also, I think we've got to keep in mind that our relationships to each of our towns and the people in our towns, is worth is worth a lot of money. It's gold, you know. It's 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 uh, we we don't want to lose the trust that I think we've slowly been building up, and it's getting stronger as we get more and more people connected to our system. And that's what I want to make sure that we that we keep thinking about as we move to possibly a slightly different model of the of the management. Does anybody else have any comments or observations on this? Alan, go ahead. Nope. Okay. Redundant. I thought of something Sorry. else. <laughs> Is anybody else? All right. Uh, um, Bond. Sorry. Could I? Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah. I, one of the things I was thinking about in this conversation is the relate, there's a relationship between the board and, or the governing board and the executive committee, right? And also the relationship between the various policy committees. I spend all my time in the legislature, right? And there's a lot of deference depending on the issue between policy committees and money committees, right? And, and thinking about what is also, if there is a shift to more of an executive committee driven decision making process, what is the role of various policy, finance, operations, communications, et cetera, mm -hmm. in informing the executive committee on different decisions that they're making? So that's just something I wanted to flag and something I'm thinking about as the conversation moves forward. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. Good observation. Does anybody else have anything they want to add or discuss? Alan, is your hand up the rear for real this time? Yeah, it is. I just okay, wanted to ahead. report some somebody asked at the last meeting whether we have to have a certain number of meetings a year. And as far as I can tell, we do not, at least not according to the statutes governing CUDs. What I do think we have to have is you have to have an annual meeting of a public board in Vermont and you have to set a time and place for your regular meetings. If you you'll you'll notice this around town meeting day, people will be announcing what their regular meeting time is. And it used to be you'd have to send all the all the stuff to newspapers and get it printed at the right time and all that kind of thing. But there was supposed to be a regularity uh, to the meetings that you did hold. Whether we could say um, we're going to have four meetings a year, I, I I think we could probably do that four board meetings. Um, I, but I think we're going to, we're going to very quickly be having a, we'll find that we have to have a lawyer begin to work with us on something like this, because some of the, some of the laws that are on the books on the state level could constrain us. It's not just the CUD laws. I think it's also the, the basic, um, uh, laws around the creation of public, public entities that are supported by the government, which we are. Yeah, I, I, I like that we're thinking about this, 
we're being thoughtful about it and we've got a lot of perspectives on it. I I don't know that we want to shift our meeting schedule right now. Um, we still have a lot going on and a lot to keep up with. And and I I don't know. I I'm almost six years into this now, so it makes me a little uncomfortable. Um, but maybe we could talk about that in the future. Jeremy Hansen, go ahead. So given that our annual meeting in May is at the time where we, you know, elect chairs and we do that, you know, statutory, statutorily required stuff, maybe that's the time that we set for ourselves to perhaps consider if we wanted to shift it to something bigger. It gives us a few months to think about it. Maybe we put an item on the agenda the next couple of times, just like any emergent you know, or any any thoughts that folks have as we go into it, and then actually have the like a real discussion uh, during the May meeting. And then if we go to quarterly, if we go to, you know, as needed, um, or w whatever, then we can we can shift to that. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, I. I uh, so the plan is right now we've got the document. Janiel, have you sent that out to the board or just the executive committee at this point? Um, just the executive committee. Do you want? Do you want? Do do? Should I send it to the whole board? I can send it right well, now. If everybody. I think wants we've been kind of it. teasing them with the idea, yeah. so we may as well go ahead. I don't see any reason not yeah. to. Okay. Um, so everybody can have some input on it. Take a look at it. Uh, send your comments. I I think it would be smoother if Janiel took the comments. Less yeah, work gonna, it's on the me. share drive. It's on the share drive. Um, so um, it is draft proposal for oh. cyber decision making authority. I am sharing it now with the entire <clears> board, <throat> so you will get it within seconds, and you can make changes okay. directly right. on the uh, document. <clears throat> right. So if it doesn't automatically append your initials or your name somewhere when you make a comment, could you put your name in the comment, please, so that we know who's making the comment? We've had a couple of issues with previous shared documents like that. Uh, Jeremy, Matt, your hand is up. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I seem to recall the whole reason that we went with the Microsoft suite is to avoid um, this sort of collective editing, which I think falls afoul of open meeting laws. So oh, um, right. I'm not sure if we can get around. I'm not sure if we can do it the way. I mean, no, oh, no, you're right. You're I realize right, that can. it's a whole lot better for Janiel to not have to have, yeah. you know, 25 different versions to merge. But I did not. I, I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. No, you're right. You're right. And that was I an oversight on my part. No, Janiel, I'm sorry. You're right. Having everybody talking in the document constitutes a public meeting and it's not a warned meeting. It's not available to the public and so we can't do it. So I'm afraid I'm going to end. Chuck, was that your point going to be too? Okay. So I'm afraid that if you have comments or suggestions, send them to Janiel so that she can aggregate them. And I'm sorry, Janiel, I know you're very busy. No worries. Um, <laughs> and uh, and hopefully this will all be smooth and cool. And Chuck, now your hand is back up again, so go ahead. Um, if you do want to be able to make comments in line, there is one workaround, which is you can either make a copy of the document uh, and, and add your comments to that copy and then share that back with Janil, whether you make that copy by making the copy in the web-based interface or you download it to Microsoft Word and do it in the desktop application if you have it. Um, that that is one way you can at least have the comments be still in line in the document, oh, yeah. which I know is super duper helpful. Yeah, good point. Thank you, Chuck. Is there any more discussion about this? The executive committee authority and the document and how to deal with things. I'm not seeing any. So the finance update, David, we kind of did that earlier. Do you have anything we additional did. you want to put in that? No, just to reinforce what we've already talked about tonight, you know, it, it, it's pretty simple from a finance perspective. We're looking at two things. One is we want to fund we we want to fund our construction progress. That's priority number one. And number two is that we want to bring on as many subscribers as possible as quickly as possible. So those those are our two areas of focus. And so we've got B coming up. We have a lot of um, of um, subscribers in the pipeline. 
to get installed. And that, that's really where we want to focus our efforts is to make those to to enable those two objectives. And that's that's about all I can give you right now as far as an update. Yeah, and we're we're really close to coming to terms with PFM on a on a loan. Uh, sort of a back a backstop loan with MCM that would give us up to six million dollars at, at a nine point eight seven five percent interest rate. Um, the interest rate is high, but you know uh, we don't have a lot of options on the table for private loans. We may have that two percent loan that that, that um, reconnect loan. We may have some ARPA funds coming in for contiguous towns to NEK broadband. Um, and then next year we'll have bead. But to fill the gap, um, we are in a position where we were likely to um, sign a term sheet and start the due diligence process for this six million dollar loan at a nine point eight seven five percent. So to the extent we need to get to the extent we need to get board approval or committee approval and or um, executive committee approval, that's something that we should at least get the authorization or you know conceptual authorization while we have the board together it's an option yep does anybody have any comments or questions about that Ooh, i'm back in the saddle we're going to stop five minutes early i'm going to go ahead and declare this meeting oh D david david darn it go you, ahead you david. let me you let me open you know I guess I'm mostly concerned about the impact on our long sustainable um, budget and financing by even taking a 10% loan. Anyway, that's my own two cents. Yep. Yeah, you're not the it's only one, concern. David. It's it's yep. it's a it's a it's a worry. It's a worry, definitely. Okay, I'm not hearing any other comments, and David's going to put his hand down. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and declare this meeting adjourned. And I thank all of you for coming and participating. I really appreciate all of you so much. Thank you. And uh, we'll talk to you later. <laughs>